Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. Whatever I teach on, I teach on because I feel like that is the leading of the Holy Ghost, and that's what the body of Christ, not just in this place, but that's what the body of Christ needs to hear in this hour. Amen. I said in this hour because God set everything according to his time, and we have to live according to his time. We can't just say, well, I want the return of Christ to be at this time because then I'll have my grandkids all grown up <laughs> or whatever. You know, for whatever reason, people want to postpone the return of Christ or, you know, a lot of Christians want to politically, let's politically get everything, you know, copacetic. Let's get everything how we want it to be. And God doesn't care about any of that stuff. The word of God is very clear that he is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And when the last person that's going to get saved gets saved, it's over. Amen. And so we have to stay according to God's timetable and making sure that the right things are taught at the right time. Amen. And um, <clears throat> I felt like what the Lord was showing me is there is a time and a season for everything. The word of God says that. Amen. Amen. It's ecclesiastic. He talks about there's a time and a season for everything, for building up and tearing down. And so I felt like the Lord started, like was talking to me about um, there's the mindset of humanity. And when we come to God, we have a certain mindset. And the word of God tr is, is there to change our mindset. In other words, our minds are set. <laughs> They're set like in concrete, and the Word of God comes to break down our mindset. Because the ways of the world and the world's mindset is not going to flow with the mindset of Christ in the earth. Amen? And we have to have the mindset of God. So when we come to God, we have... Uh, our own way of thinking and our own opinions of how things should be and how we want things to be. And we come to God with all of this. So God's word is introduced into our lives, right? And what his when his, the entrance of his word brings light and power, right? It brings peace and joy and rest. The entrance of God's word into our heart. And when we when we adhere to those things and hold on to those things and they develop in our souls to where, when, when it develops in our soul, that means we changed something, we are changed. And we can all look back at some point in our life where we see the word of God change the way we thought. Amen? I mean, I can look back even when I was saved five years and think about things I thought a certain way, but in time it changed because the entrance of God's word. It brought light on that subject. Amen. So when it comes to God's word, um, it, it builds doctrine. And we hear the word doctrine a lot. Doctrine is just a belief or set of beliefs held and taught by a church or a political party or other groups. Amen. The brownies. I was a brownie. We had a set of doctrine. This is, we live outdoors. We learn to make things and cook things. And um, when we learn things, we get a patch for it. <laughs> Amen. That shows to the outside world that we learned this. We learned how to build a fire. <laughs> Amen. We sold a lot of cookies. <laughs> we know how to sell. <laughs> so, um, so those patches showed that we had learned something. And just like in the body of Christ... The outward appearance, which is the fruit of the Spirit, shows that we've learned things. Amen? Because it's a doctrine, which means that is our set of beliefs. <laughs> but we're always continually growing. So some of, our, some of our beliefs that we have have changed since we've got saved by the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And some of them still need to be changed. <laughs> so we could have wrong doctrine, 
that means we take a set of beliefs that we had before we were even saved and we bring that set of beliefs into our Christian lives and we think that they are God because we still believe them. But they don't belong to God whatsoever. And so um, there is a, there's a time and a season for everything. And there, the, do, the word of God is there to build us up, amen, and to tear us down. <laughs> It's to build doctrine, solid, accurate doctrine in us, and it's also to tear down inaccurate, wrong doctrine. There's a time and a season for everything under the sun, and um, sometimes controversial subjects need to be tackled because the church of the living God has just let it go, let it go on into where people think that it's accurate. Like, there's different doctrine in all the different denominations that there are. That's why there's so many different denominations. Some believe in speaking in tongues and some, some don't believe in speaking in tongues. Some believe you need to be baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and some think you just need to be baptized in Jesus, and some be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And, you know, there's so many different, and somebody get, they, churches have wars on one little thing, and then they, they depart and start their own denomination because this is what we believe. And the same thing happens with every denomination. You know, like, uh, you know, they called it the word of faith denomination, but, um, and we are, we believe in the word of faith because the, the word, the word of faith has been around since the beginning of time. And so we believe in the word of faith. But all of our doctrine isn't, isn't about faith. Amen. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Hey, we got the word of faith. We, how many denominations we got? We got Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, and all those branches. <laughs> we got all these different denominations. And I've n n I never heard of the, the word of love denomination. <laughs> Amen. Um, but in this hour... It's vitally important that we know what God's love is, that we live by God's love, and we know God's love not only for us but for all men. Amen. So there's absolutely a time um, that, of, of, if, that there's a season for all things. There's absolutely a season that we are being built up, and there's a season that we have to tear down some wrong thinking, and then, then we're built up, and then we have to tear down, come against some wrong thinking. You know, and... Uh, it, sometimes it's real touchy because people might not understand what you mean by what you say. Just like if people read the Word of God, they don't know what God meant by what he said. So they, have, they try to figure it out in their own head. Like, you know, we, we don't come against the prosperity message, but we don't uphold the doctrine that that's what living for God is. Because that... That is when somebody wants to be rich. And when somebody wants to be rich, they catch themselves in a whirlpool of sorrows. We have got to know that we prosper as our soul prospers. So we could have a, a start another denomination called soul prosperity. <laughs> because we prosper as our soul prospers. Because if our soul is not prospering, and how does your soul prosper? Your soul prospers by spending time with God and spending time in praise and worship and thanksgiving and spending time in prayer and praying on the Holy Spirit and spending time and going to church and spending time in the Word and meditating on these things. It, it, your soul prospers by God, by the Word and the Spirit. Your soul prospers. But a lot of people want the prosperity without their soul prospering. So when the money comes... It, all that basically is, is selling your soul to the devil for money. And um, <clears throat> so understanding when any word is being taught, let's look at 2 Timothy 3. We're all familiar, we're familiar with a lot of scripture because we're all about the Bible here, right? But we want to continue to know what God meant by what he said. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 16, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, 
right? That's building up, right? Teaching is building up. Rebuking, that is, means tearing down old thinking, maybe worldly thinking that you think is godly, but it's not. It's, it's good for teaching and rebuking, correcting. That means sometimes adjusting. You might be on the right path, but you need a little more revelation on that subject, right? Training in righteousness. This, this is going to be happening in our lives until the day we die. We always have to be open that we are hungry to learn more of what God meant by what he said. Amen? And so that the servant, this is, this is a key word here, the servant, amen? We have got to know what God meant by what he said when he um, was talking about his servant, the, the servant of God, amen? And um, let me just look this up real quick and give you a... Uh, a, a quick defin, just a quick definition on servant. It's <laughs> you want to write this down because it's going to be real lengthy and very deep and very insightful. Word servant. Okay, you ready? One that serves. <laughs> Did we get that? Do we write that down? Mark that in your memory. It's to the servant of God. That is one that serves. Amen? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly. That means every part of your lives, the way you think about money, the way you think about health, the way you think about the things of God, the way you think about your brothers and sisters, the way you think about God's timing, the way you think about God's word, the way you think, the way you think about everything may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? So that doesn't mean you will ever be perfect and you have to be perfect, but as servants, God will give us what we need. Amen? Because he's looking for servants. Amen. And uh, I was thinking about, we were talking the other night and talking about how as you are serving God, you become a Christian and there's, you know, there's different times that we pull back from the things of God. You know, we saw that happen in the, in the let's call it the lockdown, <laughs> B.C., before whatever, <laughs> before Cove. <laughs> so, um, in, in just uh, understanding that as the servants of God, God wants to build us up but he wants to tear down the things that are holding us back and keeping us from thinking in line to his will, plan, and purpose for our lives. But he can only do it according to, to our desire, our willingness, amen? Our submission, it's, it's all really according to us because God gave everybody a free will. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, when we teach about and correct things and you think, oh, you know, um, all these people that don't live according to these things are going to go to hell. That is not at all what we are referencing to or meaning by the things we say that God requires and God asks us and wants us to surrender in a, a certain way of living by. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to see a lot of people that died, did not live by a lot of the word of God. Amen? Amen. We're going to see people there that we think, how did they make it? <laughs> and there's going to be people that you thought were going to be there that are absolutely not going to be there because it has nothing to do, has everything to do with Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice he paid. So when somebody receives Jesus as their Lord and Savior, amen, that makes them a child of God. Now, um, it, it, sometimes people like get into worrying about, you know, well, can you lose your salvation? Or they think, you know, once saved, always saved. You know, the, the fact is, it's just too many scriptures, and maybe we'll teach on that sometime, be a little controversial, but you can absolutely use your, lose your salvation. But it is not that easy to lose your salvation because you can, you can go away from God and still love God. And you can, you can even think that God's mad at you. 
And you can think that you've lost your salvation just because you're not living right. But that's not true. You can not live right. And um, to what degree? I don't know, but you've got to turn your back on Jesus at some point. So I've heard it referred to, why would you want to live as close to the line? Why would you want to live as close to the line of walking away from God? You should get as close as you can to God because that's the benefit in the, and that is the blessing of God that we can live and move and have our being with him and walk with God. And I understand there's all kinds of churches that teach all kinds of things. And that a lot of churches, anybody can live any way they want. And that at the time they start going to that church, they never, their walk with God never improves and they stay the same. And that's, that's up to them. But that's not what I'm called to do. What I'm called to do is help people to find the place in God that they can live and move and have their being as God has his way in them. Amen. I'm so anyway, we were talking the other night and, uh, Rev G was making reference, talking about, you know, he's talking in, in time of prayer, you know, he felt like, oh God, you know, he vacillates and wavers and, you know, of, of times where he's really pressing in and times where he's <laughs> not pressing in. And so he was talking to the Lord about it and, you know, like, oh, you know, he's fretting over it and feeling condemned and feeling bad. You ever feel like that? <laughs> And the Lord just kind of spoke to him about, you know, you don't have to serve me. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven that don't serve God. How it all works up there is way beyond my pay, pay scale. That's not mine. Mine is just to teach the word of God that God has me to share. Amen. And so understanding that um, there's going to be, <laughs> looking at it like a pyramid scheme, you know, people get saved and they're right here, right? And then people press into God and they, they, they want to get deeper. They want to surrender. And you keep moving yourself in a deeper and closer walk with God. And it's up to each individual. And a lot of people live down here because that's all they know, because that's all they're taught. That's all they're taught is just you know, go to church and forget about everything else. You go to church once a week and you will leave and you're fine, <laughs> you know? But we need to live our lives for God and pray. I don't know how you could have a life of prayer without being filled with the Holy Ghost because that's God's way. But we can absolutely pray to God um, because prayer is communicating with God, talking to God. And you could talk to God. I talked to God before I prayed in tongues. Amen? A lot of people, you talk to God before you get filled with the Holy Ghost and with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But there's just more power when you pray in tongues. See, you're going up the rung. <laughs> Amen? Getting closer to the things of God. So we as individuals have a free will. And we, with our will, we decide. Not God. God decides everybody to, to live in his power in his glory. Amen. So it's us and our will. Well, we decide where we're going to, we're just going to be satisfied down here or no, we're pressing in and we want to get closer to God. Amen. And so that's why, you know, Brother Hagin says most people never enter even to their, the first phase of their ministry because they're just going to live, they're staying down here. They're not push, they're not pressing in. They're not committing. They're not surrendering. Amen. And so there, there has to be this level of doctrine that we're receiving that builds us up, but we got to be open to what has to be torn down. Amen? And a lot of times that's where people squeal back because they're like, well, that's not what I believe. Well, let's just find out what the Bible says. It's like the rapture. I was always taught, you know, from a baby Christian that, you know, the rapture is going to happen and all Christians are going to disappear. They're just going to be caught up in the clouds of glory before anything bad happens. I was like, how bad does it have to get? <laughs> For people that live in certain, you know, we're here, you know, everything looks hunky-dory. But understanding, if we want to surrender, then we have to receive all what God has to say to us. Not just to build us up and teach us, 
comfort us and counsel us, but the things that, we gotta, that God wants to point in our life and say, you have to stop doing that. And, and a lot of times, most people, most of the time, when God first points something out and says, you need to stop that or you need to change that, we kind of like, oh, okay, I got to go get something. Let me go eat. <laughs> let me just say, well, I got, let me look up something. I was going to look something up. What was that I was going to look up again? <laughs> you know, when God starts talking about something for you, you're like, okay, I'll be right back, Lord. I have to, I got I to gotta put the laundry in. <laughs> you know? I got to run to the store. Got to run to the store, Lord. I'll be right back. You know, then we just try to avoid God for days because it's like, I don't want to talk about that. Nope, you need to stop doing this or you need to start doing this. You need to start praying. You, I've been dealing with you about this. I've been dealing with you about this. Amen. And so those are the things that, that we have to, in our, in our beliefs, that we've got to adhere to what God says, to, not only to the church, which is those doctrines will be taught, but to us as individuals. Amen. When God talks to us. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. This is what Paul was telling Timothy because when, um, when Paul was in Ephesus, he was raised, you know, he went there, evangelized, and all these people getting saved, but he was going to leave Ephesus, but he wanted to leave somebody in charge, so he left Timothy in charge. There has to be somebody in charge of this thing, right? There has to be somebody in charge. Amen. First Timothy, Timothy, Timothy. Timothy 1, starting at verse 3, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than ad advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these. Departed from what? They, they have departed from the goal of love. They've departed from the thing that makes, uh, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. They've departed from these things and have turned to meaning, meaningless talk. Let's just talk about the things of God, but let's not talk about the things that God's talking to me about. <laughs> let's stay away from that. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. Amen. And so Paul was making it pretty regular to talk to Timothy about making sure that they stayed doctrinally correct. Do you know that they did not have a New Testament? They did not have a New Testament. They were in the New Testament, the New Covenant, but they didn't have one. They had the Old Testament, but they had revelation on what they had, and then God was adding to it because that's why we have a New Testament. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 16, he said, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Why? Because he was going to be leading people and teaching people Amen. If he's going to be sharing the word, he's going to be teaching and rebuking and correcting and training, right? So if, if he's going to be doing these things, then he has to watch his doctrine closely and persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. How many of you want to be saved? <laughs> I'm not just talking about born again. I'm talking about born. How many want to be saved? You want to have a life of God? I mean, born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, walking in power, having signs, wonders, and miracles in your life because those, all those people, millions of people out there are not in church to receive from God. That's why you're sprinkled through the community. You're the net. You're tossed out into the sea to bring fish in. Amen? Hallelujah. So we, so we know that whatever doctrine, doctrines are being taught, that we have to open our heart and hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, because there's a, we, are, we are entering a season. There's always going to be things taught and encouragement coming, right? But there, there's coming a time of a lot of rebuking because of the false things that have gotten in the church. Subtle things, things that just pe preachers have stayed away from teaching because the controversial. Well, we's about to get all controversial up in this place, <laughs> 
because there's too many things that are being taught wrong. Hallelujah. And, you know, remember I used to say, this is probably five years ago and when I'd be teaching on things about the end times and I'd share things about the end times and I'd say, listen, what we're doing is we're planning, <laughs> we're planning for the worst as the children of God. That's a good thing. Everybody's like, whoa, no. <laughs> no, we're planning. We're prepping. We're preppers. We're preparing for the worst. Why? So that we'll be ready no matter what comes. We're preparing for the worst and we is hoping for the best. Amen? So that way, we have an understanding of what really happened in here and we don't get shook when things happen. Because why? We're the people of God. We should see it coming. And when we don't teach accurate doctrine, the people of God don't see it coming. Let me just touch on this one thing. Amen. The the pre the pre the pre trib rapture. Amen. That would be hoping for the best. But in all things, I said in all things, we have to have scripture to back it up. So, of course, I was looking for back, I was looking me for some scripture to back that up. <laughs> Let's get some scripture because everybody's writing books about it. <laughs> and they got like two scriptures that talk about meeting the Lord in the sky. But those scriptures make no reference to the time in which it happens. But they all took it and put it before a seven years, the seven year rapture. It's like, get us out of here, God. You know why? That's a fearful church. That is a church filled with fear. And God ain't coming back for that one. God's coming back for a glorious, powerful, faith-filled, love-walking, love-talking church. Amen? He's looking for servants that will lay it all down for him and stop being demanding or wanting their own way and getting aligned with the Word of God. Whenever I hear somebody say that, and I've been there because I was a hoping and a wishing myself. <laughs> because when you read all of these horrible things that are going to happen, you don't want to be around for them. Let me just say, them's is happening right now. And we is around for it. We are here. Amen? Why would Jesus take the power out of the earth that is the only thing that can save mankind. People say, well, you know, that's going to be the wrath of God, and we're not appointed to wrath. No, we're not appointed to wrath. And other people can be going through the wrath of God when you're just living in your house, just having a gay old time. <laughs> Why can't we understand that if in all of the miracles that God has done, that he can't do them anymore. Like Christians, what is being a Christian? The word Christian, the word Christ is the anointed one, which is the powerful one. That means we are the powerful ones, but where is the power? Where is the power? I love it, God moving, God is moving now, he's moving through the state, and people are getting saved by the hundreds, by the thousands, in different places here and there, in the cities. But those people have to, been, have to, have to, have to, can't just get saved, got to get in a church that's going to teach you the Bible. Not just how to stay on the bottom rung, because Jesus is coming back for a glorious church full of power. 
That means he's coming back for people that doubt, don't doubt, but they believe. I was looking, I had a crossword puzzle the other day. I look at crossword puzzle. And in the crossword puzzle, I had the word distrust. And I'm thinking distrust. Now, I wasn't even thinking about the Bible. I was just thinking distrust. Well, like, what would be a word for distrust? So I'm doing words around it, and then it came up with the first letter was D. I think D, distrust, D, dis, distrust, dis. Uh. So the next word was O, and I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> mm. The word was doubt. The word doubt that Jesus referred to often the word of God, the New Testament, refers to often. It says, do not doubt. Do not doubt. It means do not distrust God. Whenever we doubt, we just take it lightly. Well, you know, I was just struggling with a little doubt. No, you're not struggling with a little doubt. You're having invaded in your very being not to trust God. It means you don't trust God. You don't trust God. You don't trust what God said. You don't trust that God's going to take care of you. You don't trust. Hallelujah. We've got to trust God with all our hearts and souls. And that if God's word said it, it is so. Hallelujah. We've got to be storm chasers. Water walkers. Dead raisingers. <laughs> Amen. This, a lot of people, this is a false, it is a fallacy, it is wrong, it is absolutely error in the church to think that only the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are the ones that have signs, wonders, and miracles. It's not true. Those are the ones that teach about it because they're familiar with the territory. Amen. We have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every single child of the living God is called to do something. And that's another error. Thinking that, oh, well, you know, we're just Christians and we just, you know, we just do our jobs and then we come to church. No, every single child of the living God must learn to walk in the presence of God. To walk in the fruit of of the Spirit in order to have the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. We've emphasized these things and solidified them to a small group of people, and that is not God. God is coming for a bride, and who was a part of the bride? Everybody. Amen. But he's coming back for a bride. That means it it's not just apostles, of prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. He's coming for a bride. That's, all, that's a body. That's a body. And we are all in the body. And he's coming back for a glorious body. He's coming back for a powerful body. And not one cowarding, hoping and praying that we have a, a pre-rapture tribulation. That means we've got to be prepared for what is coming. Because if we're not prepared, there's people are not going, they're going to bow. There are going to be Christians that are going to bow to the bunny. <laughs> the bunny, the bunny. Ooh. <laughs> Veggie tails, the chocolate bunny. They are going to bow. We got to remember Shack Rack, Shad Rack, Meshack, and Abednego. They refused to bow and they got thrown in the fire. Amen. All of those that could not have bowed, but they bowed. They bowed to the world. But only a few, a remnant, didn't. And they got thrown in the fire. But in the fire, they saw Jesus. All the rest of them didn't see Jesus in the fire. You're going to have to get into the fire if you want to see Jesus. Amen? We can't be deniers. We can't be deniers of the power. We cannot be deniers of the Holy Ghost in filling with the evidence of speaking in tongues. We cannot 
be shy or timid or withholding these truths. We've got to tell people, otherwise, how are they going to know? And we got to be so thoroughly convinced that wherever we're at, we at least have two scriptures about it. Amen. And absolutely have the Holy Spirit and the fire that we can convey the importance of having these things. One man, one man, when I was a baby Christian, told me that speaking in tongues was of the devil and kept me from speaking in tongues for a, a year. And in that, in that year, my life was falling apart. And then a year later, my husband died and I said, that is it. When I prayed in tongues, there was power in my life. And when I stopped, there was no power in my life. I don't care who tells me about speaking in tongues. I'm going according to what the Bible says, and I'm speaking in tongues, and I've been speaking in tongues ever since then. That's why everywhere I go, I don't care what country I've been in, what island I've been on, I always preach about the Holy Ghost and the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I pray. I always have a prayer line for people to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Fill them right away. And tell them, pray in tongues every day. Pray in tongues every day. Because there will be power in your life. Amen. It's so vitally important that we tell people the truth. Whether they like it or not. <coughs> you need to be more Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. It's so vitally important, so much so, that we have to got to make a decision for our own life. Are we going to walk with the Holy Ghost? Are we going to serve God? Are we going to serve ourselves? Are we going to serve our flesh? Are we going to serve our old way of thinking? Are we going to adapt to God's thinking? The timing is critical. God is not going to wait for everybody to learn correct doctrine. He's not going to wait. He's expecting us to come to him and ask him to show us. The pearl of great price. Seek first, seek first, seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. God rewards those who diligently seek him. So we can live down here our whole lives. And then we could die and go to heaven. But we'll never experience what God made us for. Amen. He's coming back for a powerful church. And you got to be ready to be beheaded for Jesus. People that teach pre-tribulation rapture are just instilling fear into the body of Christ. There's not one scripture that talks about a rapture that's not even, the word's not even in the Bible, that talks about a rapture that's going to happen before the, before, before the tribulation. But it does talk a lot, a lot about Christians being on the earth during the tribulation. People are like, I, I, I've talked to ministers about this. I've talked to them, and they go, well, I go, how come there's going to be so many Christians that are going to be on the earth during the tribulation if there's a rapture before? And they go, well, they're just going to all get saved because of, because of the, all the literature and all the things that we leave behind. And I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, you're an idiot. <laughs> in love. Are you, all, are you kidding? So God has a special place for these Christians before the tribulations, the scaredy cats. <laughs> all the scaredy cats that don't believe in power, don't believe in raising the dead, don't believe on walking on water, don't believe in multiplying fishes and loaves. They don't believe in the miracle working power. All that, we're going to take them up so that all of these that are left are going to somehow get taught and learn how to walk in the miracle working power of God by all the people that left. <laughs> all the scaredy cats left all this scaredy information behind for all of these people to get saved and somehow walk in power. 
so much power that when the government comes in and says you're going if you, if you don't take this if you don't take this mark then you're going to get beheaded <laughs> and you're like you can't take my life my life is hidden in Christ this body wasn't meant to live forever let the heads roll that is going to happen during the tribulation you know how I know? Because how can you refuse the mark of the beast if it ain't there yet? And the mark of the beast comes during the seven-year tribulation. Whether it's the first three and a half and the last three and a half is irrelevant. It's the seven. <laughs> Amen? So we have to understand, you ain't getting out of this by no rapture. So we might as well get prepared for what's coming. How do you get prepared? Get lost in Jesus. Get lost in God. Walk with the Holy Spirit. Lay down your life. Amen? Forget what you hold so dear that isn't proven in the Bible. Books, videos, movies, all about a pre-tribulation pre rapture. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody talking about the heads rolling. Let's see an accurate. Let's see an accurate movie about the Bible and the tribulation. But I'm not talking about all this destruction. I'm not talking about this great apoco apocalypse. Did I say that right? <laughs> not some great where all the buildings are blowing up and all these tidal waves and earthquakes. Yeah, there's going to be those things. We got them now. What's that got to do with walking on water? What's that got to do with, well, we're going to starve. We got to get all these five-gallon tubs. What about multiplying the fishes and the loaves? What about believing in the word of God? What about believing in God and that God is all-powerful? What about parting the Red Sea? <clears throat> they didn't bring five-gallon buckets of food with them across the Red Sea. They just, somehow God provided for them. Manna from heaven, what about that? Don't you think God wants to do that kind of stuff again? <laughs> We're the children of God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and he's looking for some people that will believe in him. But we can't go very far if we're going to hold on to our little pet things. we got to let everything go and say, God, I surrender. I want to be prepared. You know, God, at one time, God was getting ready to go into a better place, a promised land with his people. But he realized there was too many people that didn't have faith. He's like, we can't go into this place. <laughs> We're not going into this place with these people. <laughs> and somehow, I've got to have a... <laughs> We're going to have to get rid of these people in such a way that we can have a mass funeral and burial at one time. So God's like, got it. I'll have an earthquake. And it'll happen right underneath each person that has not, doesn't have faith. You don't think God can't do that? He did it before. The earth shook. And every single one of them that was not of faith fell into the cracks and the crevices of the earth. <laughs> and all those that had faith were left standing. A lot of people don't like hearing about these kind of messages. And everybody of faith was still standing on the ground because it didn't open up under them. And then, bam, God closed the ground back up. Instant death burial. <laughs> And then he's like, okay, we got rid of all of those that are not of faith. Why? Because God is moving forward. He is on a timetable that we know nothing about. All we got to do is stay in sync with the Spirit of God and let the words of God resonate in our very being, our core thoughts. And then he took those that trusted him. 
Those that believe that what God said, he would absolutely do. Those that believe, even though they were going into the camp of the enemy, that God could take care of those enemies. Amen? So they all entered into the promised land. And God says, okay, let's have a parade. <laughs> let's have a parade, man. We're in the promised land. And they're like, are you kidding? Look at these walls. No, those, they all died. These are the ones looked at the walls and said, come on, let's do this thing. Got rid of all those that didn't have faith. God loved those people just as much. So what God said, let's have a parade. So they marched around Jericho. <laughs> we're having a parade. And God's like, okay, now <laughs> we're going to blow the trumpets. <laughs> uh, so many Christians think they got all figured out. We don't have it. We have nothing figured out. We just got to trust him. Amen. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Amen. Christians are just holding out. They just, let me just say, those that are holding out for a rapture are going to get swallowed up by something. <laughs> and God's going to take all of those that are people of faith and believe that God can do anything. And he's going to take them into a millennia. <laughs> How's he going to take them into the, you know, there's another thousand years coming. It's not the end of the world. It's the end of the world system. This earth is still going to be here for a thousand years. Amen. He's going to take those people that didn't care about a pre-tribulation rapture. He's going to take those that are full of the word and full of the power. They walk with God. They walk in the spirit. They have signs, wonders, miracles. They walk in love and they walk in hope and they walk in faith. Amen. He's going to take them Line them up. And their heads are going to roll. What a glorious day. What a glorious day for those that are beheaded in the tribulation. I can't even tell you. People, when you meditate on these things and you get your heart and you get your face right, you'll be excited about it. Because it's what to come. Jesus was excited when he was going to face the cross because he knew what was coming. You and I. Amen? Doesn't matter if I preach here for five minutes or five hours. We need to hear these things. Amen? Hallelujah. Because all of those... We have to remember this. All of those that are beheaded during the tribulation. It says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus. We're going to have a testimony about Jesus. Amen? And because of the word of God, we're going to have the word of God. Amen? They had not worshipped the beast. We are not going to worship this world, the system, the false Messiah, amen, or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. We are not going to get involved in any worldly financial system that marks us because we're already marked by the Holy Ghost. Amen? They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It can't be said any clearer. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. That means everybody else that had died during or, or, during or before or any other time that died that were not beheaded, that were not beheaded, that they did not at this time get their resurrected bodies. I can't even tell you how excited I get about this. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it's because I've meditated on these things and I've read these things and I've got faith for these things. It doesn't matter. 
Amen? The worst thing, if they're lining up Christians and beheading them, and they absolutely are, and there's no change in this politically. It is set in stone. This is going to happen. And this is going to be the people of God, Christians, amen, that didn't compromise on their faith. They did not compromise in love. They didn't compromise in the word. They didn't compromise in their trust in God. They didn't compromise at all. Hallelujah. So because of that, that group of people, that thousands, thousands upon thousands of groups of people are going to be raised from the dead with their resurrected bodies. The same kind of body that Jesus got when he was raised from the dead. Amen. Everybody else is going to still just be a spirit being. They're not going to have their resurrected bodies until the after the millennium. We've got to remember that. That doesn't mean they're not saved. They just didn't make the cut. <laughs> now, let me just say, if you have a resurrected body, you can't die. If you have a resurrected body, you don't suffer pain because that's not the kind of body you have. Your body doesn't suffer illness. Amen. Your body, you can't die. Those that are beheaded are going to live for the whole thousand years without sickness, without pain, without death, without, with, with no lack, no want, just faith, hope, and love because they've been through the fire. Amen? For a thousand years. I wouldn't mind being in that group. If God so wills me to be in that group, that is the group I want to be in. But you can't be in that group if you're raptured before the tribulation. That's why there isn't one. But this is a different time. This is a different time. And God knows what time it is. Amen? And we've got to stay on God's timetable. God has a timetable, and we've got to stay on his timetable, not our own. Amen? Amen? How vitally important we understand. This is what I'm saying. I don't care what anybody teaches. I don't care how good it sounds and how bad you want it. You better find out what the Word says. Amen? I have never found one scripture that talks about a pre-tribulation rapture. I read something about getting caught up in the glory that the, the dead shall rise. Let me just say, it says the dead shall rise. But the word of God just said that they have to wait. What are they waiting for? The millennial. The dead, didn't he say that? That they had to wait for the thousand years to be over. So that catching away, it says that they'd be caught away and to be with the Lord forever that catching away is after the millennium. That pre-trib that everybody, the, the two scriptures that people use, the two scriptures that people write books about and teach volumes on about a pre-tribulation rapture is after the millennium. <laughs> all you got to do is read. It's all right there. Amen? We're just going to have to keep talking about this stuff. You know why? Because Christians, the body of Christ, is preparing, is preparing for a rapture. They're preparing for a pre-tribulation rapture. And it takes no faith for that. It takes no faith. You have to walk in love. You don't have to have signs, wonders, and miracles. You have nothing. You just, we're going to be taken out of here. There's going to be a trumpet, and we're going to be caught up. Well, when you're lying enough to get, are, are you going to let them cut your head off or are you going to take the mark of the beast? This takes faith. Takes faith. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I just want people to be as excited about this as I am. You got to get excited. Amen? You got to get excited. You got to get excited about wanting, wanting to have a resurrected body for a thousand years 
and help and serving and serving Jesus is going to be on the earth and he's going to be the king of glory and he's going to rule and reign the entire earth and only those that were raised from the tribulation being beheaded only those are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years not a bad gig amen Woo! i don't know i just get excited about it <laughs> i understand we're on the other side it doesn't sound exciting but when you've meditated on these things <laughs> you just get excited amen so what is it to lay down my life now if you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I just want to share with you for a moment the importance of receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You might believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and the King of glory, but you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So you can just say a little prayer right while you're there. I'm going to just pray with you. Say, Father God, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for the life that he has given me, I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's just that simple. If you believe that in your heart and you just said that, that makes you a born-again Christian. It doesn't mean you understand everything. Hallelujah. It's a lifetime of learning of the goodness of God. Be acquainted with the Bible and all that's in it. And when somebody teaches something, Go to the Bible yourself and start searching through it to see if what they're saying is true. Find a good Bible church, amen? A Holy Ghost Bible church that teaches the Bible, amen? And you are welcome here if you're in the area. If not, just begin to communicate with God and ask God what you should do, amen? He will show you which church that you need to be a part of, where you will grow and flourish, also your family will. Amen.